Hi, welcome to video number two. This is where we're going to continue with our preparation of our Dutch Masters class. And uh, what we've done so far, just to quickly recap, is we've taken our panel, or if you have a canvas, and uh, we've prepped it according to the instructions. We used the last layer of it, though, just some plain titanium white, so that we put on what is called this absorptive ground. The ground is what the artist would use to prepare their surface. And they wanted a ground that was a little bit absorptive, but not so much that it would pull all of their binder or their glue out of their paint. So just finishing off with one coat of uh, titanium white, or if you need to, two is fine, but one or two coats is uh, is preferable. And uh, uh, just getting a nice uh, kind of smooth surface, kind of filling in the surface. And that's what I have here. It's uh, dried really, really well. I let this dry. Uh, actually, I let this dry just for a couple of days because we're taking our time with this painting. You don't have to let it dry for a couple of days. You can get right into it if you need to, just using a hairdryer in between because these products dry very uh, quickly and hard very quickly, so you don't have to worry too much about that. But uh, I had the time, so I did it. And uh, then I used my little tool here with my sandpaper, and I went across the grain this way uh, for a final sanding of it and made just an absolutely smooth surface, filled in the grain very nicely. Now what we have to do is we have to do the next coat on, which is really a, a ground, another version of the grounding color. Now, the Dutch painters changed. Uh, they were quite a bit different. You know, when you're looking overall at the breadth of the Dutch painters, if you look back into the uh, latter part of the 17th century, De Heem and Mignon who were, and, and Van Elst, who were the premier painters of the Dutch styles, uh, they all would use versions of a Venetian red or an English red oxide or vermilion type colors. Vermilion was very preferable, uh, was a color, and, and the English red oxide were couple colors that were very easy for them to attain. And they they put down these bright oranges uh, underneath there, and and but Mignon would do it a little bit. Mignon and Dehim would do it a little softer, more towards the English red or the Venetian red, which is a little more tone. Now, why did they do this? This created a wonderful glow through the colors as they uh, as you started to paint, because we're going to be painting with a grisaille or what we call a dead layer on top of this, and it created this. Um, this unique feature of warms and cools and easy for them to control the warmth of their grays as they applied it. And we saw that when we painted the uh, Van Elst painting. Those of you that painted with uh, the Van Elst painting with me several years ago. And this orange eventually calms down through all the layers of glaze, but you, you see that glow through it. Well, when we went down and studied the original of this painting, you can definitely see the orange through the background of this particular painting. So Van Huysen, who follows Mignon, Van Huysen, uh, in painting this, used uh, the orange background on this painting. Now, he he was 30, about 32, 33 years old when he painted this. This is before he changed completely to what you see behind me, the techniques that we did behind me that he became known for. As a matter of fact, uh, his first real big change comes two years after he did this particular painting. He really changes and starts to switch over to do the, uh, the reddish, what's called the reddish umber uh, technique underneath. And so uh, you see a, a lot of change in him over time. Prior to that, though, he is and in his early 20s and his er, early part of his 30s. He is a huge fan of Mignon. He comes just right after Mignon. And so he follows all the Mignon techniques, the Mignon and the uh, Dehem techniques, the, the traditional Dutch masters techniques. So that's, and on this painting, you can clearly see on this painting in the original because of some of the faded layers you see this orange background this this english red oxide orange glow underneath the colors and then you see the gray grisaille on several colors that have been fugitive so we know just by studying the original this is what he has done on this painting and we know through some of the books of van heisen's books that in the early part of his career he followed uh, mignon uh, completely so 
What does all that mean? That means our next code is to put down some of our English red oxide color. English red oxide, here's the English red oxide. English red oxide is uh, our PR101. There are many different varieties of this. This is why you'll find it in some different names. The one that I use here, which is different than the one that I used in when I made traditions, colors, and stuff like that. This is a different variety. This is the more older uh, European variety. It's beautiful. Uh, since we were able to manufacture the heritage uh, using the ground pigments. We now use ground pigments into this paint. We're able to use the older traditional uh, Dutch versions of it. So it's a beautiful, rich, deep color. This is very traditional for the Mignon technique um, and what the artists of the, the Dutch artists would use, uh, you know, for during the, the latter part of the 17th century. But Van Hyassen, you know, also, as you can see in this painting, and when you look at this this painting and when we're looking at this, you see this lovely light glow that's back up and through here. And this is at the beginning of Van Hyacin where he is beginning, you know, in two years he makes a radical change to the real light backgrounds. And so this painting is is kind of reflective of his uh, his transition, his transitional area of, of finding himself as an artist and where he's going to go. And so I, I would have to believe, and especially after studying the, the original for several hours, the I would have to believe that he did brighten up almost like a Van Elst orange in that particular area, trying to force more light uh, through that area. Now, other Dutch masters at the time did not like his interpretation of the Dutch flowers. They felt that everything should be darker in in, in the flowers, like a mignon, like like mignon, and what de Heem, uh, have been doing, you know, for the previous century. And so uh, he he received a lot of flack, really, a lot of. Uh, uh, you know, complaints about, you know, this particular style. But eventually he he developed it even and moved completely away from the Grisai. But like I say, this is one of those pivotal paintings. It's a beautiful way to paint it. It's a different interpretation of uh, Van Hyacin and Mignon. And so I'm kind of excited to do it because I've done the Mignon completely, the Mignon technique and Van Hyacin's older technique. And this is one where it's kind of changing. So it's kind of exciting. And we've done Van Els too. So... What we're going to do is we're going to, to to emulate this light glow back behind there. We're going to start out with some English red oxide. And into the English red oxide, I'm actually going to put a vermilion color. Now, you can make vermilion color. You can, you, uh, you can make vermilion color anything very, very easy with about uh, three to four parts Hansa yellow to uh, one part of the uh, naphtha red light. That makes a beautiful vermilion. Uh, color. Uh, Paranone orange is a very, very bright orange pre-tubed color that we have. It's very expensive and I know some of you have written me uh, and asked me if they can use the Paranone orange and like we did in some of the Van Hyas, uh, Van Alst paintings. Yes, you can use the Paranone orange for this. It would even create a little bit more of a glow uh, back behind uh, the painting. So Paranone orange would be fine. But the uh, less expensive way to do it is just to go ahead and mix yourself up a, a, a nice vermilion uh, type of color, which is going to be about three parts, and we're going to need a lot of paint here, so it's going to be about three parts of the um, uh, Hansa yellow to about one part or so, three to four, or about one part or so of the uh, naphtha red light. This something right around in there is going to be fine for you and it's just going to give you just a nice bright orange because we're not going to use it straight like this. Uh, thank goodness. <laughs> you know, those of you that, uh, uh, you know, we did the Van Els that lived and survived through the Van Els. We had this orange canvas for a long time. So we'll have this a uh, little bit brighter orange here and let's step back here just a bit. So I have this brighter orange and I have this uh, uh, this English red uh, oxide. Now, what I'm going to do is, I, I on a photo, back in through here. So the center, the center uh, half, really. So if you just come in a little bit and come in a little bit, we're going to want to have English red throughout the canvas. And then right in through this area where this glow is going to be. It doesn't have to be perfect at all. Right in through that area there. We just want to brighten it up with some orange. It does not have to be perfect because, like I say, um, 
the majority of the time they, you know, in the early part of the pain, they would use just pure uh, English red oxide. So generally what we're going to have is we're going to have our English red oxide out here. Now you can use a very soft brush and you can see this beautiful English red oxide. Beautiful, rich, rich, rich color. Beautiful color. I love that color. It does have a lot of power and a lot of glow behind it, too. And so it, it, it works very nice. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to be doing this several coats. I'm just going to, you can start out by giving the whole thing a coat of English red oxide and then just just push some orange, just model some orange into the center. Or you can do them both at the same time. I would rather you put on two or three very thin coats than to get one coat and get texture on. We've got this beautiful smooth ground now. We want to preserve that. So I'm going to be thinning my paints with water. Now you can use a very, you can use a soft brush like this, which is beautiful. This is the preferred way. You can also though, you know, these brushes are expensive. You can also use like a tile set sponge like what I use here and you can get these in your home store in the tile department there's tile setter sponge and you just put a little water in it okay I'm just going to put a little water in it and I'm going to just tap into some of my English red oxide here and you can see this lovely coat here and I'm going to put it on a little bit thin just model it like this okay when you reach the uh, let's step back just a little bit more okay the top part of the canvas, which this is huge up and through here, this will be all the English red oxide up here. When you're down into the center area, though, I want you to start touching into and brightening up with a little bit of this orange. And you'll see there's not too much of a value difference between them, but you will see a little bit of a glow difference between the two. So I will go from darker English red oxide up here and just through the center area down through here, I'm going to allow, allow this to get a little bit more of a glow to that. So come down, you know, about a third and or at least a quarter and a quarter. And then the whole half center section here of this painting should be more, a little bit more glowy. But basically right into this area where you're going to have, when you look at the photo, where you're going to have this lovely through light that he's going to have here. I'm going to brighten that up so that'll make it that that through light will have a little bit more of a glow. And we'll get that from either the Paranormal Orange or the Vermilion. Okay, so we'll start out with putting on some of the English Red Oxide. We're going to do this a couple times. If we want this, this to be eventually, we want this to be opaque. So it's going to take us a couple of coats through when I thin it out with water like this. English Red Oxide around like that. And and then some of this lovely orange and stuff here into the center. And just work the two colors together. Try not to have a, a harsh dividing line with it, which it's it you won't get it because these two mix together very, very well. Just kind of just kind of you know sponge blend them there together. Okay, we'll get both coats on, then we'll get them well dry, and I'll be back. Okay, while that's sitting over there drying, what it'll do is we'll talk just a second about the pattern. Now, the pattern, when you print it off, will come in a number of pages here. As a matter of fact, I'm using the middle size one, which has gone up to 34, like I said, because that's the size of this one, and I'm going to put the two of them together. Um, the uh, pattern will print off, and, and I believe like the, the smaller one is 9 pages, this one's 16 pages. And so the 9 pages would be, they, they, the pattern pages, when you put them out, they'll go 1, 2, 3, and then 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Uh, this one with the 16 is going to go 1, 2, 3, 4. So it's 4 by 4. Uh, and the other one is 3 by 3. So you take the first top page that's up here like that. It has just a little corner of it. And then here's the second page of it, which will go here. Now it'll line up top and bottom. You just have to move these over until they, until they line up here. So you might want to take a pair of scissors or something and just cut off the excess that's going to be right here. And then, so that one will go there. Then your next page that will go here you'll see where the leaves are going to go overlap so that one will go right into that position there and then the following one will go over there it's a very large pattern tape it all together okay tape it really good on the overlaps tape it all together and get your pattern so the next one they overlap about one inch or so each time so this one the last one will go over here on this side then the next one starts back down here again we'll start right down here 
and so they go four and four so if you keep them in order as they print off this way then you can just lay them out like this one two three four or one two three and then three and three and the patterns all line up like this and you'll be and then tape it all together okay so get that all taped together we'll come back and i'll show you a little bit about uh, the plastic how i go about transferring it okay let's tape up our pattern okay welcome back i got that all kind of taped together this is a big pattern. It's a very big pattern. So hopefully you have a pretty good sized table that you can uh, put it out on. So I taped it all together and I left the overlaps. So they overlap. And you know, one thing a word is, you know, you should, you can to help you register all of this, all the pages are tiled so they're all you know they should if you line them all up page wise with the lines you can um you'll keep the registration it's easy to put together some of my students will go over to their big window and start taping it up on the outside you know tape it to a window you can clearly see through the window the glass especially on a sunny day and then you just peel it off after you've taped it up but you tape it up in, in tape position or you can take a straight edge and run it against the paper's edge here like this and you can see you're all registered and that just keeps it, but it should just all go in numbers like that and put it together no problem the next step is to transfer now some people like to use the tracing paper and something that's fine i like to on a painting like this that we're going to put the pattern on multiple times um and you know because we're going to be working from the back to the front we're going to put some of these elements on three four five times and this is the first grisaille pattern it doesn't have all the detail in it that the regular uh, that the pattern is going to have here so some of these areas that you see down in here we're going to be having uh, more things coming on those as i start as we work in each of those areas with the final details of the grisaille so we'll be putting this pattern on several times so because of that i like to use a plastic a plastic film and I have all different kinds of it. This is a kind of a film here that I get. It's a, it's a uh, three mil film that uh, I get at the local art store. Uh, it is kind of expensive for a large roll of film like this. As a matter of fact, I have it set over here. Let me grab it real quick. It's a big roll that's like this, and uh, it's very expensive. And it, you know, but you can get it in this three foot roll like this, which covers this painting really, really nice. Um, that's one way to do it. It's an expensive route to do it, but it is a way to do it. The other way to do it is you go to any of your local craft stores that sell floral supplies. And I love this film, too. As a matter of fact, this is a great, great way to do this. And you can store the pattern back again. Just roll it right back up when it's done. Roll it right back up over this roll. A roll that's like this. This is floral uh, um, cellophane. This is called floral cellophane. And it's thin, and I like it, but it is very, very tough, and it won't tear or anything like that. It's very tough, and it lays out just just really nice and flat right over the surface, so you can take off your pattern really easy. You can position it, and you can put it back on really easy. There's no problem with that. Um, and uh, a roll that's like this, I think it's like $8 or something for a huge roll. Uh, and uh, I love it. I use it for a lot of my paintings, especially paintings that, uh, you know, are curved surfaces and stuff because it bends over the surface really nice. So you have this. This is not quite... It's just a little bit short to do the whole thing, so you might have to tape two pieces together. But uh, it is... Well, actually, no, you don't have to because it goes this way. It fits perfect this way. You unroll it this way. So a roll that's like this will do all of your patterns really nice, okay? Now, the uh, next step is to sit down and you take the pattern off. Now, you need to use a permanent pin. These are the types of pins. Let me just zoom in. This is the type of pin that we have at our studio. We get these from Japan. I love these. These are instantly permanent markers. They have a thicker end right here for making wide lines, and they have a thinner end over here for making the small lines, the detail lines, which is what I'm doing right now. And they're instantly permanent, which means I put the line on and it will uh, instantly not smear anymore. Now, the problem with doing something like this that I find is I have a very dark pattern here. And if I come in here and I start taking off the lines, pretty soon it's kind of hard to see what you have taken off so far to what you haven't taken off. You get lost in there very easy. So there's a little trick. 
and you can use, depending on the size of your paper, like this is a 20 pound piece of white paper. And so it's a real, it's a lightweight one. It's 17 by 11 we have out of our copy machine. And if I shove that underneath there first, I can just lightly see the, the design underneath. You can see where I have and have not traced. And uh, you know, here it, I can, I can see it. I have to fight it just a little bit because it is, uh, you know, the paper's just a little heavy. So if that happens to you, what you can do is you just take some uh, tracing paper. This is a piece of tracing paper. You could just fold the tracing paper in half and you can take a look at it there and now you can see, okay, I can clearly see the difference between my lines where I have and haven't. If you want it even more opaque, you just fold it over four times you know, or four thicknesses of it. it. Depends on your tracing paper, the type of film that you have or whatever, but you put that underneath. And as you can see this time, I can still see my lines here. Four times I can still see my lines, but I can clearly see here now, as I take off my pattern, I can clearly see where I have and have not drawn my lines. And the reason why I like this marker here is it's instantly permanent there. So it, it doesn't smear at all. And that's what, that's what I like. So I can slide my hand around and all that stuff to it. So we don't, I, I want you to be as careful as possible when taking off this pattern, but this is not the final detailed pattern. So you don't have to worry too much. So, you know, just, uh, it's just a long process of of taking it off. Nothing has to be absolutely perfect. This is our grisaille pattern. And then we, as we get to the final grisaille, I will give you more patterns and, and more details. But um, grab yourself a uh, wonderful cup of tea, uh, put in a nice movie, and you'll be here for an hour or so tracing off this uh, particular pattern, okay? But I'll give you time for your board to dry anyway, all right? So I'm going to transfer my pattern off, and then the next part is to just center it up. I'll show you. We'll center it up on the design, and then we'll transfer it with some uh, white uh, transfer paper, and we're ready to paint, okay? So give me a little bit, and I'll get this on. Okay, I got that uh, traced off, and I got this beautiful orange color. And as you can uh, see, it's just, uh, it, maybe it's dependent on your monitor, it's a little bit brighter up in this area. This is that nice vermilion color vermilion, and the, uh, um, uh, the English red oxide are just a value or so different. So don't look for a light and dark difference. Look for a brightness difference. So you can see like up here in the corner. And see, I didn't worry about getting this exactly uh, smoothed off. That's all going to be taken care of. But there's an area of really bright and then there's an area of tone. So I come down and then let it start to get bright in this area where we're going to be putting that, that light through. Okay. Now the next thing is to reach down here and grab my, uh, my pattern and... Um, set that out. Now, what you want to do is you want to center, depending on your board and everything, you want to just center it up. You know, you have a top little flower up here at the top. That's what you want to make sure that you measure down from that. And then you want to make sure that you measure from the bottom of your plinth here. Now, I also like to leave just a little, just a little bit more uh, room there at the bottom, just because we're going to put some shadow to that plinth down there, the, the tabletop there, the plinth at the bottom. But uh, just a little bit and it's fine. But this board fits this pattern just absolutely perfect. And then center it up from side to side. One of the farthest reaching things that we have out here right now is the tip of this tulip. And then over on this side, down over here by the grapes and this little flower that's here. Now what I do, so I center this, I kind of center it up the idea of where that's going to be and then uh put a little i took a chalk pencil and put a little mark underneath the pattern here about right where the bottom of that plinth will be and then what i did was i measured up and on this one it just happened to be about an inch and five eighths or so i measured up and then i drew a straight line all the way across here like this and what that does is that's going to give me a nice reference line to make sure that the bottom of my plinth now I will put that bottom of the plinth right on that line and then I know that my table my table line and everything is going to be uh, parallel with the actual frame of the painting here. So I'll drop that down. I'll, I'll move this over and center this back up. The table will be a little short over here and some grace. We're going to fade this all the way over here. So we have some more stuff to be painting over there, but you don't want, you want to give just a little bit of a space there and have that same space up over here onto this one uh, in that place. Then tape it down really well into position. 
okay? And then what we have to do is we have to go about and sit down and transfer once again. Now, like I said, this pattern uh, is missing some things. There's a few leaves, a few things, and, and like one of the flowers I missed is going to be right up here. We're going to be painting this so many times and putting on some detail areas. Like these are just generalized areas of these flowers that we're just going to sigh around, and then I'll be giving you more detailed patterns. We'll be applying those when we do the detailed Side. So these are just general areas of these things. We're going to be painting these for lost and found edges and everything. So you, it, you know, it doesn't have to be absolutely perfect, or you have to have absolutely every single line on right now. As a matter of fact, this pattern that I'm giving you has a lot more lines than I generally give because I usually work from the back to front. But I find that uh, students feel a little bit better when they see a little bit more of the pattern on, and they don't worry about it. Plus, we'll use this for some referencing later. But anyway. Um, we're going to need to transfer it. Now, what I'm going to do, because this surface is slightly dark, I'm going to be using the light, uh, the light paper here, and which, uh, you know, we need to, we need to do. So you tape it down really well in position. I'm going to be using white transfer paper, and, you know, you can get this in big sheets, or you can do one little area at a time. And then, again, to uh, help me, let me reach over here and grab this, to help me know exactly where it is that I have been tracing and stuff so far, what I have and have not put on. Excuse the noise here for a minute as I tear that off. It's the beautiful thing about having stereo mics here that they pick up absolutely everything. <laughs> but I will, let me zoom in a little bit here onto this. So I put a light piece of tracing paper over this, okay? right into this area here. And uh, if I use a hard pen, this is a hard uh, um, ink pen, and then you go back over this line again, pressing down like this, and you can press pretty hard. You can see that you can transfer, uh, you know, transfer your pattern, and then make sure you check it here. Let's lift this up and check it. And, and you'll see there's the, the two grapes that I transferred there. So what's nice about this setting that down, setting the uh, piece of tracing paper over it, this will let you know what you have and haven't traced. And then later on, when we go back to, um, you know, putting on our pattern several times and refining it, it'll be very easy with this clear plastic to uh, reposition our pattern because we'll be able to see right through it. But, uh, you know, so we're using the light here. You transfer all of your lines just like that we have here, and your pattern will transfer and transfer it pretty dark, and uh, you know press it pretty hard, transfer it pretty dark because we're going to paint all of this out, and we'll I'll show you some uh, fun ways to get rid of those. But you won't have to worry about graphite lines with this type of painting; they all paint out. Okay, transfer them really heavy, and transfer your pattern, get it all in there, and then we're all set up to uh, do the grisaille. And next time we'll talk about the We'll start the painting and start the grid side. The fun is about to begin. Okay, see you next time. I hope you enjoyed it. Get your patterns all on and we'll get started. See you later. Bye-bye.